Good evening. My name is Frank Gamero, and I um, have some gentlemen here that do some wonderful things for veterans, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. They're with Vets Flick, and this is Dan, and that's John. So, Dan, please say hello to the group. Thanks, Frank. Thanks for having us here tonight. Uh, our, we work for a company called Vetflix, and Vetflix um, is doing a unique thing for veterans. We're honoring them by capturing their stories, filming interviews with them, and then taking their stories and trying to turn them into things that can educate the American public about what veterans have done for us. Well, that's nice. I know I saw you at the State Veterans Advisory Council doing mm -hmm. some stuff, and I was amazed <coughs> because lots of people talk and then you don't see them again, you know? Mm -hmm. So now, John helps you with this, or? Mm -hmm. I got involved with uh, Dan when I got a phone call from him. I hadn't seen him for uh, many, many years. He was my old college roommate. Oh, really? And when I got the call, he explained to me he was starting this project, and he explained it to me on the phone, let's get together. And uh, I met with him, and in a very, very short time after he explained what he wanted to do and he wanted to capture uh, the stories of veterans, uh, I was hooked immediately. I, I knew right away that this sounded like something valuable, something important, something that wasn't being done adequately. Um, you know, there's a lot of stories in the media about war and about battles, but there aren't enough about the average um, uh, soldier, uh, right. the, pe the people who are out there every day slogging it out and the things that they do and, and uh, the ones who don't want to talk about it, which is most of them. And so uh, well, that's one of the discussions I was just saying before we went on the air is that most of the people that have been in hard combat, hmm, they don't say a word. They right. just deal with it. It's very rough. Right. And I think I spoke to you the other day and I was telling you when I was young, I used to watch the movie Battle Cry. I used to keep going to the theater and watch it over and over because my mother's brother, younger brother was in the Marines in Iwo Jima and I loved it, you know. And then uh, my mother did work on Grumman Avengers up in New York. Hmm. So I liked winging a prayer. So what I would suggest to anybody is, you can look at some of the movies today or video games, but go back, watch Battle Cry, watch Winging a Prayer, watch Bataan, and you can watch back to Bataan, but Bataan is good, and 30 Seconds Over Tokyo. And you know those were B-25 Mitchells, bombers, that were on an aircraft carrier that did the 30 seconds over Tokyo. And because of that, they built it to show how powerful bombers and Air Force would be. So the Air Corps became the United States Air Force a couple of years after mm -hmm. that. So I would just suggest people see that and really watch it. Some of the actors that are actually in those were in combat or in the military. So, but go ahead, continue with what so you're doing. The, the thing that we're doing that's different is we're talking to the actual people who were there, the people who made history. Uh, and as you said before, it's not the easiest thing to do to find out what a veteran went through. A lot of them don't want to talk about it. Um, a lot of them have repressed it for years. And so what we do is uh, use the power of a neutral third party. So we go in, we don't know them, we don't have a relationship, and we say, tell us your story. And we build a level of trust where they tell us their story. So we've heard many times, I've never told anybody this, That's right. or I don't think my wife even knows this. Uh, and we take the time to really hear their story. But this is, uh, Vetflix is really a story of reinvention in the Great Recession of 2008. So I spent 30 years in high tech. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a computer scientist and building computers and such. And then in 2008, I lost my job like a lot of people out there. And one of the things that I did was I tried to find the same job that I lost. Uh, but that didn't work out because the jobs weren't there. So I started looking at my skills and saying, what am I good at and what are the things that I could do? But at the same time, I took a little brother through Big Brothers Big Sisters. And this little brother, this 12-year-old boy, introduced me to a 100-year-old man living in the woods of Brookline all by himself in a house that he built with his own hands. And so I started talking to this man, his name was Bob Flannery, and helping him around his house. And he started telling me about what it was like 100 years ago. And he started telling me about what World War II was like. Right. So he was in the US Navy in a, a group that's called the Seabees, which is the construction battalion, the guys who built all the bases and 
you know, the airstrips and right. whatever needed to be built. These are the guys who built it, and, and that's what he was part of. Um, so I, after listening to him for a while, I said, this is gold. When he dies, he's 100 years old, all of this history is going to be lost. So at that point, I contacted John and said, he has 30 years in audiovisual experience, and we said, we ought to, you know, talk to these veterans and capture their stories. And that was a really powerful thing to do. So what we do is we interview a veteran for however long it takes, hours, I mean, sometimes eight hours, <laughs> if you get somebody who likes to talk. But because we spend the time with the people, that's how we get the stories that are not just the normal stories that they've told their whole life, but they have time to think about it and they tell us some incredible, incredible things. So we've interviewed uh, over 70 veterans. That's good. Yeah, of all eras, including <coughs> uh, active duty. So even today, capturing the history of what's going on today is really important. Did you, by chance, go up to the state veterans home? Oh yes, we've been there many times. All right, because we were there and there was a gentleman that was a, a, in the Navy, but it wasn't, it was called the Navy Guard. Mm -hmm. And they had rifles and stuff mm -hmm. during World War II. Mm -hmm. And he was 105 years old. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you met this other gentleman, I'm sure he's still there. He was uh, de Gaulle's interpreter. Oh, really? For Eisenhower. Really? And he's up there. So if you go up there, really? That's very uh, you should go. Yeah, there's some lots of history that people don't know. And I have to agree with you totally. Lots of people don't understand. Those that have seen real combat and had to deal with it, now I'm saying dealt with it, they're quiet. I was talking to you before, my father-in-law right. did a lot of stuff, captured, re ran away, did everything, and became the provost marshal for the city of New York. He never said a word. Yeah. Never said a word. Then right. all of a sudden, I was the only one he was ever talking to. Right. And he had decorations of decoration and never said a word. Right. And people don't understand. And you take Audie Murphy. He didn't want to do the movie because it wasn't about him. But he did it, and they said, just do it so people will understand, and he did. And if you go down to Texas, where his memorial is, you'll see his statue. And the story goes that his wife would wake up yelling at him, stop, stop, and he'd be on top of her choking her. Mm -hmm. That's post-traumatic stress. Mm -hmm. That's things that people don't mm -hmm. know veterans have to deal with. Mm -hmm. So they keep it soaked in. They don't want anybody to know how hurt they are or what they've seen. So what else are you going to do? You're coming into the new theater with the Gulf War and... Well, War so, on terror. And so we, we've talked to people from all eras, from World War II. Obviously, we started with a 100-year-old man, so World War II has a special place in our hearts. And at this point in time, we're losing our World War II veterans so quickly that capturing their stories is becoming really important. Right. Uh, but there's a healing quality to it, too. So veterans today that get to tell their stories, their family gets to understand them better and understand what they went through. You're right. And maybe that helps them cope going forward in, in, in life. So it's both a retrospective, uh, you know, looking back from an older person or from a younger person's view, it may be helping them heal going forward. So it may be a benefit for the next 40 years instead of the past 50 or 60 years. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then that's a, it's a great point. And one thing that we, we uh, find through all of the conflicts is, is that there's so many commonalities from from the different uh, wars that people talk about and uh, we hear many of the same themes over and over again and it's interesting how that from war to war to war some of the same things that people deal with uh, you know coming home and how it affects family and all those mm -hmm. sorts of things but one of the things that we're uh, beginning to work on now is the idea of you know how do you talk to a vet because as Dan mentioned sometimes very often uh, they're telling us things they've never told anybody. That's right. And and let's face it, it is hard to know. Gee, what should I ask? Sh you know, how can I how can I ask them a question if I don't think they want to talk about it? Because we all feel like, well, geez, maybe there's things they don't want to tell us. And so, a lot of times we don't ask the questions. It's a, it's a it's a tricky bridge right. to cross. And the so, truth of it is, that's the default position. Right. When somebody comes home from war, everybody says, "Don't talk about it." Right. That's yeah. right. And so the habit becomes, "Don't talk about it." Right. So how do you ever find out what your son or daughter or father or uncle went through exactly if they right. never talk about it? Right. Yeah. And what, well, just with the Vietnam War, those troops caught hell when they came home. Mm -hmm. That's horrible. And in the military police corps, we were taught to go to Washington or anything. We were on high alert. 
to defend the country against American citizens that didn't even understand what was going on and they throw things. I mm -hmm. could tell you stories you wouldn't believe, but that's beside mm -hmm. the point. But uh, there's so many people that have had to come home and just do it and seal their mouths mm -hmm. and just said the heck with it. Mm -hmm. And only, only because of the Vietnam in-country veteran as the Korean War veteran got any respect mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they came home, they didn't even say hello, goodbye, nothing to mm -hmm. those people. That's yeah, true. you've heard that, yeah, yeah. it was very surprising. That's right, and they saw a lot. Yeah. They saw a lot. So mm -hmm. Korea was bad and they lost the, the same amount of troops as Vietnam only in a three-year period. Mm -hmm. but. They serve their nation, and like I told you before, my issue is respect the American flag. Mm -hmm. Don't lower it every time somebody dies. Mm -hmm. It's up there. When you serve in the military, you take the oath. It's to keep our flag, full staff, three words, free and aloft. Mm -hmm. Not pinned, not restricted. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. I'll let you finish what you were so Frank, what we do is we create a legacy for a family. We do a film of their interview, and we give them a DVD, which will last forever so oh. it's kind of cool to think that your grandchildren's grandchildren could at some level get to know you and and understand what you did for our country so so that I think has really long-term value but what, what I want to do is is show you a little a little film that we made sure based on uh, the boot camp experience which is something that almost all servicemen share and, and, and this is a, a, a modern person talking about it uh, but this will give you an example sort of of what the interview looks like and how the, the story gets told. Right. So and like I said to you, boot camp is Navy, Marines, Coast Guard. <laughs> yeah. Basic training is Air Force and right. Army. But we can all call it boot camp. Right? Yeah. So this is a Navy but guy. That's really so interesting, actually. Well, it was Navy and that. Army, so I was yeah. involved. Yeah. Okay, so let's watch this uh, short film. I remember September 11th happened. I was in 10th grade. I was actually in my uh, Algebra II class when uh, the, the World Trade Center fell, and uh, we all knew that we wanted to do something. Um, all my family was prior military. My dad was U.S. Navy. My uncle's Navy, other uncle's Navy, one uncle's in the Air Force. So military history was pretty relevant. And uh, my, all my uncles and my dad served in Vietnam. I graduated May 20th and I was on my way to boot camp July 7th. I really didn't know what to expect, but I was just kind of just going with it. I was, I was committed to it and I was like, all right, well, you know, you're only gonna know what's gonna happen when you get there, there's nothing you really can't prepare yourself mentally for it. Physically, you can do all the running and push-ups and sit-ups that you can possibly do, but for something like that, there's there's really no mental pre preparation you can do than maybe like have people you don't know yell at you for 12 hours a day for no reason. All the civil trees were out the window. It was do what you're told when you're told to do it. Don't ask why, just just get there. And. Uh, I was, it was just a complaint. I was like, wow, what did I, as soon as I got there, you're in a line, everything you brought with you, you're told to drop and throw it away. Like, you brought, like I had my book bag, you know, I brought a book to read, a couple other things, and they're like, everything in your hand, drop them. All right, and they, they wheeled a, uh, a trash can by, and you had to throw everything away. And I was like, wow, I didn't expect that at all. And I was like, here I am in nothing but my, my, my well, now what we call it is civilian clothes, but here I am I in some shorts and a t-shirt, and then, they're like right face and we march down and you go through this pretty much assembly line of clothing you go through your your urinalysis right there right there and there and I mean that was awkward enough as it is there's just this red line like two feet from the wall and you drop your trowel do your thing and what was funny is about that is I looked over and my book that I threw away was on this guy's desk and I was like that's my book I was like man I want that book back and I, of course you know let me get my book back and that's not gonna happen went through the process to the urinalysis and you go into this like assembly line of of your initial issue of your what we call PT gear or our Smurfs is what we called it our Smurf uniform which is our uh, sweatpants navy navy PT shirt and uh, hoodie and tennis shoes and socks and you just drop everything right there and the guys that had been there a little bit longer are waiting to class up or giving you your initial issue and you know, you just go to the next station, get get that get that initial issue, and just keep going through. 
you get all the stuff in your your sea bag now and you're like man what is going and it's, it's like this like you're just going through it you don't even really have time to think about it by the time you're done with it you're sitting there in line and then you're sitting on the floor waiting for your rdc for your division your actual your sign of division you're waiting for that the, the rdc to come you know pretty much pick you up for school is what it felt like you're like waiting in line and you know, your, your parents come to, to get you you walk off and he, like, they just pretty much just separate from this point to this point. You guys are division whatever, and that point, you're division this. So it's like, oh, man, what division? I'm so excited, you know. You know, how, what's it going to be like? And then we get up and march off to our spaces, and it's at night. So you're, like, walking around, like, I don't know where I'm at, what's going on. Didn't know what to expect. I mean, it was, it was really, it was exciting and terrifying at the same time. It was one of the greatest experiences of probably my life was the first couple of days of boot camp. Let me so explain something. I did the United States Navy, and I understand him. And we used to wear white shirts in boot camp t-shirts. We had to go like this and have your thumb like this and your hat on there, inside out. So this guy, Danny from Plainville, Long Island, was there and the guy that was learning to be a drill instructor says, uh, anybody got any questions? He was a deep sea diver and everything. You know? So the, this guy, Danny, says, yeah. I said, oh, geez, don't ask him that. The, the Navy was rough, <laughs> trust me. So then uh, he goes over and he starts talking to him and he says, what can I help you with? So he says, sir, he says, when we wash our hat, he says, the yellow is always in it. You had to do your own stuff by hand in the Navy back then, in 63. So he says, take off your hat. He says, sir, he says, take off your hat. So he says, okay, so drop it on the ground. He says, sir? And he says, drop it on the ground. And he takes it and he whips it on the ground. And he says, now step on it. Going, oh my God. So he says, step on it? He says, yes. So the Drill instructor goes and digs his feet into the dirt. He says, now you go and wash it. I'm like, oh my God, don't ask this guy nothing. But the Navy was three words, deal with it. The Army was do it, complain later. The Marines was suck it up. The Air Force is call your congressman. And the Coast Guard is man overboard. And you <laughs> learn those three things and you learn to do it, you know. Yeah. So, I understand, and you see how pristine everything was folded on him? The Navy, really when I had to yeah. go in, you had a duffel bag like this, and you, you had a thing in your mouth with your hat size, neck size, shirt, waist, shoes, everything. He says, okay, and they, they would stand there and say, say you were me, and you were like this. They take your, your shoes, boom, hit you in the face, boom, right nice. into the bag. I'm like, oh my <laughs> God. And we, back in 63, I think we got like two hours sleep a night because we used to do watch, got our underwear out on the lines, did all kinds of things. But they teach you that right. so that when, you're, when you graduate, oh, you can deal with it. Yeah. And that's what you do. And every branch has their own reasons for doing it, and they do a good job. Today, it's a little rough because a sergeant will go up to somebody, can I fix your gig line? That's your line here with your belt. Mm -hmm. And they ask a recruit. Back in the day, you didn't have to do it. The Marines would dig up the little bugs. It was rough. Mm. But you know, you did the right thing. And you were there for your person next to you, in front of you, behind you. You were all together. So yeah. I'll that's let you character. continue now. But that's what it was. Well, it was interesting if, in that clip. What, what I didn't expect him to say, which caught me off guard, was after explaining this procedure in boot camp, and it right. sounded like, you know, it was extremely challenging. Then at the end, he says, that was probably the greatest three days of my life. And I'm like, wow. I mean, he, yeah. you know, and that's what, that's what we see over and over again is these people who go through th these tough things who are so dedicated to what they're doing and so devoted to, the, to their branch and, and why they're there. And, and they put themselves completely into it and, and they, they get such pride out of it. And that comes across with so many of the people we interview. Well, what they do is they break you down. They don't want to hear about your mother, your father. Right, right. In the Navy, if you had a shirt lined up wrong, they'd go and pull it and make everything else come out. You had to refold it. 
if you were reading something from your girlfriend or your wife, yeah. they'd read it in front of everybody, say, oh my God, don't do that no more. But you learn, again, the Navy was deal with it. Mm. And each branch, they want you to understand, if I tell you, get over there, you don't ask no questions, boom, you're over there. Oh, and that's right. what you had to do. And that's right. things that the general public, I'll put it like that, that never served in the military, doesn't really understand. And I can understand him saying in three days. Boot camp basic training is rough. Even today, it's a little easier, but it's rough. Because if I tell you to do something, no question, you go do it. And that's the way it is. And and they, have, they have very limited time, really, when you exactly. think about it. There's a very, very small amount of time they have to get you processed through yeah. that. That, uh, that, that whole procedure. And, and, uh, and when I was in the Army, you know, they were taking us by buses and trucks yeah. out to the field shooting and everything, a little bit of marching and everything. So the guy says, oh, there are no buses today. And I started laughing. He says, what's so funny? He says, you worried about marching? He says, well, we got to march. I says, I was in the Navy. It was double time with a rifle over your head. And if you saw somebody, you had to stop, come to attention, and salute them. And you couldn't move till they dropped the salute for you. And then you went, and boom, you kept going. Everything was double time. Mm -hmm. So. People that weren't in, see, you folks have talked to people. You understand. Mm -hmm. Well, but that's, that's the beauty of what we're doing here because even in that short film about boot camp, it works for both sides. So I watched exactly. you nodding your head and saying, <laughs> yeah, I remember, I remember that. that. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, yeah. people who haven't been in boot camp or who haven't been in the service, it's like a mystery. It's yeah. like, what is boot camp? What's it like? And he does such a great job of articulating that experience. Yeah, that he teaches people who weren't veterans what it felt like to be a veteran. Even just that little moment of, you mm -hmm. know, this is one of the most amazing experiences of my life. You know, we can relate to that, even if we didn't go through it. Right, yeah. you that's get a, to see it. That's yeah. a great point, and, and um, to add to what Dan was saying is that, uh, and, and, and I'll include myself in this prior to this uh, working uh, on the Vetflix project, is most of us, get our information and perspectives about the military through popular media, movies, what have you, or um, uh, the news. Well, you know, that's okay, but that's, that doesn't, first of all, it's not always an accurate representation. Movies are designed to be entertainment and the news is there to, you know, sell advertising. So you don't always see it all. You don't You're see correct. the daily life. You see the highlights and the worst of, you know, and. Well, that's why I so, named those four movies. They were a lot different back then. Yeah, right. yeah, so. Uh, right. uh, but still, there's nothing like talking to the actual people. And, right. you know, so our original vision was this was going to be something for the family, that we would do a film and it would be for the family. But along the way, through things like the State Veteran Advisory Committee, we learned a lot about veterans and what we learned is there's a disconnect in America today between the people who are serving and the rest of us. Because it's not like Vietnam or, or World War II where there was a draft and it was fairly um, e e uh, equitable. So mm -hmm. most everybody had somebody who served. Now, 0.7 of a percent of our population serves. So that means that most of us don't even know a veteran. We don't even know anybody who's been paying the price of our freedom. You're right. So we think, well, at Vetflix, what we've done is we realize that having these stories for families in a drawer somewhere is great for that family. But the real utility of these stories is in sharing them with other people. So we've held film festivals at the Red River Theater. Um, we've gone to reunions of veterans around the country. Uh, we had a show in New York on Sixth Avenue. Um, so we've gone out and trying to get the word out about what veterans have done because we think that disconnect is really dangerous. It is. So this is a social challenge for the next 50 years. We have you know, 2.5 million post 9-11 vets who are all gonna be coming home, some fairly large percentage with challenges ahead of them, and they need a country that cares. They need a country that can relate to them. Right. And how can we relate to them if we've never understood or never heard what they did for us? You know, so that's what Vetflix is trying to do, is take the stories that we record and put them into a form that other people can use and learn and relate better to veterans and care more about veterans. And in, at the end of the day, support veterans. You know, the fact is, if you look at Washington, they haven't even come home yet, all of them, and their benefits are being cut, and there's a big argument about taking things away from veterans. 
what's it going to be like in 20 years or 30 years? And let's not kid ourselves. These people are going to be around for 40 or 50 or 60 years. This is a very long-term situation that we have to deal with. And if we just take them and put them in a corner and say, okay, those are the people, they're the veterans, they're the weirdos under the bridge, then we've disenfranchised the very people who have paid the price to make this country what it is. Mm -hmm. So we think that this is a really important mission to show these films and tell their stories and help the American people understand what it is that veterans have done so that they can support supporting them in the future, really. Well, I think it's very good. I like that you're doing it. And the coalition that I'm with, which is this patch, um, like I said to you before, the chairman, Level of Light Infantry Vietnam, evacuated mm -hmm. Tower 2 in 93. 9-11 mm -hmm. came out, so the tail go through Tower 1. Uh, I was in Washington, and I met a gentleman. Uh, his name is Andrew Chernak, mm -hmm. 199th Light Infantry. And he saw some things. On his birthday, he was actually shot and medevaced out. Mm -hmm. And he was a sergeant. And going mm -hmm. through the times, the Gold Star Mother statue, he started that project because he went to this woman's house. They called him from Pennsylvania to go to New York mm -hmm. to go and see this woman to do a, a plaque for her son. So he says, oh, can I get, talk, meet the mother? So he goes to meet the mother and he says, she says, yeah, in that table is the Western Union that my son is dead. She says, I never touched it. She says, would you mind if I looked at it? She says, no, you can. He opened it up and he went like this and he's reading. He went, oh my God, I was your son's replacement. He died two days before I got huh. there or whatever. Oh, okay. So wow. that's when he did the Gold Star Mother statue. Okay. And if you go to Stanton Plaza, you will see it. And Gold Star Mother is someone their son or daughter died while in service. Huh. So it's respect and accountability. When I first saw the statue, I said like, it's a little strange looking, you know, I didn't understand it. Then I saw mothers that lost their son or daughter, and when they see the tear, mm. the bent knee, boom, they connect and they get tears. Mm -hmm. They say, God bless them for their sons. You know, what the son gave that we could have freedom and liberty. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate what you're doing with this. So is there something else you got on here as a so video? I'd just like to show you one, one other short film that combines the voices of, of a bunch of the people together. And it's, um, it's a short film about being in harm's way. Okay. So this is really, I guess, the, the bottom line for a lot of veterans is being <coughs> in harm's way. Okay. But uh, the first time to Afghanistan, we left in February. We're out there, it's so hot. So hot on that deployment, it was 135 degrees at noon. This is our first tour of duty, so didn't know what to expect, but we we certainly found out what to expect when we landed in Vietnam. You're looking out the uh, window, and you see you could see the terror on the faces of these men who were getting ready to go into some conflict. We got woken up in the middle of the night by two big booms. Uh, two mortar shells had entered the camp and almost hit the birth the female birthing on the other side of the camp. It just it rocks your world. Our whole Tent, our whole birthing was shaking. Nobody told you anything. And all of a sudden there's this boom, you know, it comes from a distance. And then if it started getting louder and louder, boy, your old heart started going because you didn't know whether you were in that line, or whether you were to the side of it or what. And that was a very helpless feeling. That night, some rounds started coming in, so, and all of a sudden, I was, we were, there were two to a hole, and I remember something hit me, hit the, my bag, and uh, it, my, my foot kind of stinged a little bit because it was cold, but I figured that was it. And the guy that next to me said, that, that round hit your, tore your, your bag. And I said, yeah, it sure did. I said, ooh, looked over. And the, he said his blood was kind of, well, one of the rounds hit me in the, in the side of the foot. So anyway, I called Corman. And uh, from there we heard, um, we heard small arms fire from their AK-47s just raining in the camp. You look out and they're just, they're overhead flying in the camp. Corman came over and said, we're gonna have to take that, that toe off, but the metatarsal is all shattered too. Uh, but we don't have it, uh, 
enough anesthetic like Novocaine and stuff. And he said, do you smoke? And I said, no, I don't smoke. You know that. And so he got, got a package of pell-mell cigarettes, the long piece. He said, I want you to smoke as many of these as you can. I, I said, yeah, I told you I don't smoke. He said, you go ahead and smoke them as many as you can. I said, well, I'm going to be dizzy as I can. He said, well, I hope so. He said, that was my anesthetic. Tell me a few more that. things and... Um... Well, so the idea that this is a social mission is really interesting. And, and we have looked at the financial model of this for a few years. We've been in business for almost five years now. And our original vision was that we would do this for veterans and their families would, would embrace it and pay for it. Well, that hasn't turned out to be true because the realities for veterans are a lot of them are on a fixed income. Yes. A lot of them have health issues. Yes. A lot of them don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. And if um, they go to Phoenix VA, they don't know if they're going to walk out alive. Well, well yeah. I've been down there. <laughs> exactly. I've seen what's going on. So, so the idea was that, that we had to find a way to finance this. So we established Vetflix as a 501c3 nonprofit. Good. So this is a nonprofit company that's trying to do a social good. Uh, we're trying to do uh, a service for veterans, but also a service for the community. So our, our greater good, our greater hope is that we can show people with our films what veterans have done and that that will educate them over time and, and, and create a better New Hampshire and a, a better America. Well, better America is the right way to do it, you're right. And I always discuss things and the gentleman now that's doing the program with us inside there, he's amazing because we did an American flag project and I'm gonna ask you this question. Do you know where the first actual national American flag comes from? Gotchas, eh? I don't. Comes from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. No kidding. Yeah. John Paul Jones went there. He was going to take a ship to France. And the ladies in the banquet cut up their dresses or gowns, whatever they did, and they made the American flag. And it's the one that went to international water to France and was recognized as the original national American no flag. Kidding. And if you ever go to the State House, you walk in the main door, and you look to the left over by the swords. And you'll see Harriet oh, yeah. Dame. Yeah, I've seen it. And Harriet Dame is wearing the Medal of Honor. Hmm. People don't know that. Uh, I guess we only have a few more seconds here. So uh, we'll cut it short. Well, thank and we'll you. We'll see you again. Okay, so John, thank, John Dan, thank you very much for having me. You finish us. whatever you got to say, <laughs> and I'll let you finish it. People can go to our website at www.vetflix.org, V E T F L I X, and see more of our. Our films. All right. Now, are you going to do this just in New Hampshire, or you think you're going to get extended a little bit? We already have done this. We filmed all over the country. We filmed in Mississippi and California, and pretty much everywhere in between. So oh. it's not just a New Hampshire thing. But because we live in New Hampshire, a lot of our work is in New Hampshire. Well, so. that's good. And I got a friend of mine. I'll give you his information. He was the commanding general of the Cambodian Army, and oh. his family, his mother and father, were shot and killed. Oh. And the CIA wound up taking him into California to do missile defense. Wow. Huh. So I'll give you his information. And people don't know how many people in Vietnam and that whole theater were working together and got things done. Mm. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you very and much. people, please help them if you can. And respect the veteran. And always remember, the American flag, full staff. Don't keep lowering it. The people that served our military do it to keep it full staff. And they, you don't know what they deal with. If you meet someone that was in the service and they don't talk about it, you have two words, and I want you to understand this too. Don't say, thank you for your service. That means, oh, thank you for your service. I got a cup of water. <laughs> no, yeah. it's two words the Vietnam veteran put out. Welcome home. You got it. You got it. Welcome home. Welcome home. Thank you, folks. And I hope you enjoy this flick. And I hope these people can move on. And our veterans, welcome home. Thank you, Frank. Thank you.